Welcome to Catalytic Leadership, the podcast designed to help leaders intentionally grow and thrive. Here is your host, author and leadership and executive coach, Dr. William Attaway. Hey, it's William, and welcome to today's episode of the Catalytic Leadership Podcast. Each week, we tackle a topic related to the field of leadership. My goal is to ensure that you have actionable steps you can take from each episode to grow in your own leadership. I believe, like Craig Rochelle has said many times, that when a leader gets better, everybody benefits. Your team, your department, your customers, your clients, your spouse, your kids, everybody. Each week, we spotlight leaders from a variety of fields, locations, and organizations. My goal is for you to see that leaders can be catalytic no matter where they are or what they lead. I draw inspiration from the stories and journeys of these leaders, and I hear from many of you that you do too. Let's jump in to today's interview. It is an incredible honor to have Jeff Barnes on the show today. Jeff is a Walt Disney historian, the author of two best-selling books, The Wisdom of Walt and Life Lessons from Walt, each capturing the details of this entertainment legend's life and the lessons his successes and failures can teach us all. A motivational speaker and workshop presenter, Jeff channels his love for Disney into engaging live and virtual experiences for audiences helping them learn life's greatest lessons and discover the foundation of the magical destinations that are loved around the world. When he's not given a personal tour of a Disney park, you'll find Jeff exploring local ice cream shops or traveling throughout the U.S. visiting friends. Jeff, it is such an honor to have you here. Thanks for being on the show. Well, thank you. And, um, you know, I really think it's a, it's a privilege to be with you and um, be with your listeners today. I would love for you to share some of your story with our listeners, particularly around your journey and your development as a leader and now as one who is talking so much about leadership. How did you get started? So I um, I, I was in higher education for a little more than two decades, and I figured out really quickly that you know leadership isn't about title, position, power, authority, where you rank in the org chart. Um, You know that you're a leader when you have followers. And (laughs) uh, lo and behold, Walt Disney never wanted to be called Mr. Disney. Mm -hmm. Um, In fact, uh, one of my favorite stories was when he was eating breakfast one morning on Main Street and a relatively new cast member was serving him breakfast, didn't know that he hated being referred to as Mr. Disney. And she was a little bit nervous. And as she was serving breakfast, kept referring to him naturally as, you know, Mr. Disney this, Mr. Disney that. And finally, he stopped her and said, you know, young lady, um, there's only two misters here at Disneyland, Mr. Toad and Mr. Lincoln. You can call me Walt. And, (laughs) you know, for Walt, it was about, you know, your ability to have a vision, lead a team and get them to go in the direction that you wanted them to go, but quite mm. frankly, they needed to go. Yeah. And, you know, one of the lessons that I teach in, in my workshop is most people, to include Walt's own wife and brother, believed that the first Disney park, Disneyland, would be bankrupt, shuttered, and forgotten in six months or less. Oh. And when you step onto Main Street USA, uh, originally it cost a dollar to get in, But if you didn't go deeper into the park and spend more money where the ride shows and attractions actually were, and they weren't on Main Street, that prophecy, that prediction was going to turn out to be true. Walt had to give us a reason to follow him and go deeper into the park. And he gives us those reasons, starting with Sleeping Beauty Castle. And it's just fascinating to me. We step onto Main Street USA, which is a turn of the century Midwestern street, but at the end of that street is a medieval castle. It makes absolutely no sense. And yet we can't get down there fast enough. (laughs) And I tell leaders all the time, you know, you, you have to give your people, you have to give your team a reason to follow you. And it's not about your title. Mm -hmm. And so when you walk into the park, every cast member has their name, first name on their badge and where they're from. That's it. 
And, and that's an homage to Walt who only ever wanted to be Walt. And, um, you know, I, I think that's a great lesson. Uh, you know that you're a leader when people are willing to follow you. We're willing to follow Walt deeper into the park because he gives us a reason to go deep, deeper. He cast a vision there at the end of Main Street USA. Now, Jeff, one of the things that I loved in, in learning more about you was your passion for a great story. What does every great story require? <laughs> well, I, I'm, I, I appreciate the fact that you value that. Um, first of all, uh, folks don't realize it. Um, for all of Walt Disney's successes, uh, whether it's Mickey Mouse, whether it's Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, even Disneyland, Walt most wanted to be remembered as a storyteller. But here's mm. what people forget. Uh, a great story isn't about once upon a time, nor is it about happily ever after. A great story requires conflict. And mm. we as human beings were wired for conflict. It's why we read the books. It's why we go to the movies. It's story that separates Disneyland from every other amusement park. It's why we keep going back again and again and again. We love story. However, when it comes to conflict, when it comes to obstacles, adversity, hard and difficult things, most of us back away. And so I challenge my students, my readers, my audiences, if you want to level up in your life, if you want to be a better leader, if you want to live a better and greater story, then embrace conflict, be willing to do hard and difficult things. Um, remember, the bigger your dragon, the better your story. Hmm. Do the, do the Disney parks teach us anything about overcoming obstacles, facing adversity and conflict? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, the Disney parks don't have rides. Uh, they have attractions and those attractions are there to tell stories. Mm -hmm. And um, that's, again, sort of what separates it from other amusement parks. Mm -hmm. And I believe at the end of the day, those stories are then challenging us to go out and live our own great story. Um, and one of the best examples, uh, at least originally, uh, was in the Fantasyland Dark Rides here in California. Snow White Scary Adventures, uh, Peter Pan's Flight, Snow, uh, Mr. Toad's Wild Ride. And those attractions were never created to retell the entire story. They're not long enough, mm -hmm. um, but rather to evoke the emotion associated with the story. So Snow White's Scary Adventure was all about fear and danger. Peter Pan's Flight, Awe and Wonder, Mr. Toad's Wild Ride, humor and comedy. But interestingly enough, Walt, because he was inviting the guest to get off of the sidelines and being a spectator and inviting us to become an active participant in our own great story, he left the lead characters, he left the heroes out of those attractions, out of those rides, because he wanted the guest to be Snow White. He wanted the guest to be Peter Pan. He wanted all of us to be Mr. Toad. Mm -hmm. And from 1955 to 1983, none of the guests got that. They were very upset and frustrated because they all wanted to see Snow White. They all wanted to see <laughs> Peter Pan. Everyone was on the lookout for Mr. Toad. And so they did a renovation of Fantasyland in 1983, a $55.5 million renovation. And they put the heroes, the lead characters, into those rides, into those attractions, into those stories for the first time, which was great for fixing Fantasyland. But I think the real lesson here is if you want to live a great story, if you want to lead your team, if you want to see your own dream come true, you're going to have to step up and be your own hero. That's so good. As you talk about leadership, do you believe there are things leaders can learn about leadership from Walt Disney and from Disney? Absolutely. Land? Yeah, absolutely. Um, first of all, uh, Walt was once asked, what does it take to be successful? And uh, coming out of higher ed, what I find fascinating about his response is Walt never got past ninth grade in terms of formal education. So the answer wasn't a high school diploma. The answer was not a college degree. And Walt said it really comes down to four C's and not the, you know, C's get degrees kind of answer. Yeah. Um, for Walt, it was um, four C's, which meant um, confidence, courage, 
curiosity and consistency. If you can mm-hmm. nail those four as a leader, you're going to enjoy success. And if you have to pick one, pick confidence. And um, Walt was incredibly confident in himself, in his stories, in his ideas. Um, his wife, Lily, said he ne- she never saw Walt beaten at anything. And understand, Walt, like all of us, was not born successful impoverished childhood, difficult relationship with his father. And a lot of us forget this. 99 years ago in 1923, with his first studio, Laughagram Studio in Kansas City, Missouri, at the ripe old age of 21, was bankrupt. Hmm. And it it was the bankruptcy um, that compelled him to board a train with $40, a single suitcase, and a one-way ticket, come to California start a second studio, a second studio with his older brother, Roy. And it's the second studio that today is the largest entertainment company anywhere in the world. So again, master the four C's, confidence, courage, consistency, uh, curiosity. But when you fail, and you are going to fail, when you have a setback and you are going to have a setback, do what Walt did. Believe in yourself, believe in your ideas, Keep moving forward, go all in, $40 single suitcase, one-way ticket kind of mindset. Mm, I love that. And I love that you called out that failure is part of the journey. And so often we see that as the enemy, right? (laughs) Oh, yeah. And, um, you know, I I, I asked this question of my keynote audiences, you know, what if Walt never goes bankrupt in Kansas City? What if Laughagram Studio is a success? Then maybe he spends the rest of his life there. Uh, And there's nothing wrong with Kansas City. I've had the privilege of speaking there a number of times, but it's not going to be the level of success that he would come to enjoy in Hollywood. Mm. And so a lot of times our failures move us forward into an even bigger and better future. Mm. I I can see and hear the heart of an educator in you. You know, coming from from higher education and how you love to communicate and to share the insights and experiences that you have had. You've called Disneyland the happiest classroom on earth. I got to tell you, I've spent a lot of time in classrooms. Happiest place on earth, not something I would typically associate with that environment. Why do you call Disneyland that? So I... um. I've had the privilege of teaching the world's only accredited college course on the history of Disneyland. And yes, it's a lot of fun. We go to the park. We enjoy a field trip. Um, But the course isn't really about going to an amusement park, riding roller coasters, getting an easy A. Hmm. Um, I, um, I, I spent a lot of my time as an administrator, dean of student success, working with struggling students, students who Mm -hmm. um, had the ability, but they weren't attending class, they weren't doing their homework, they weren't taking the exams, and they they simply needed that nudge to get back on track and on a path toward graduation. And, you know, the principles of success, the principles of leadership, the principles of, you know, seeing your dreams come true, they're fairly universal, but I wanted to find something that would really resonate with the students here in Southern California. And they all love Disney and they specifically all love Disneyland. Mm. And I knew Walt's story. I knew the stories that the park tells. And I was like, wow, if I could connect these two, this would really be an opportunity, uh, you know, to, to leverage something here. Mm. And so I pitched what I called my Mickey Mouse idea Uh, to teach a college course on (laughs) the history of Disneyland. And I was very fortunate. The, the university, uh, you know, bought off on it and um, it's been really, really successful. Uh, Not only because, you know, it's a course about obstacles and adversity and, you know, doing hard and difficult things and talking about Walt's life and, you know, embracing this idea of story and conflict but in addition to that, you know, Disney is so multidisciplined. It, it, it's business, it's art, it's entrepreneurship, it's engineering. It, it's just got everything. And so, you know, my students, you know, get the background, they get the U.S. history, they get the business, but then they come to recognize 
that at the end, of, like all roads seem to lead to Disney. And hmm. they're really, really, really impressed by that. Now, when I was when I was reading about you and your commitment to this college course on Disneyland, I read something remarkable. You once put off surgery for a life-threatening brain tumor. I did. So I had been dreaming of this course for quite some time. Finally had the courage. And, you know, we have these ideas, these crazy thoughts, these dreams, just like Walt did. Sure. Um, mine was to teach a college course on the history of Disneyland. I knew it was a Mickey Mouse idea, but it, it would not let me go. I talk about it as being like one of the hitchhiking ghosts from the Haunted Mansion. You know, it <laughs> followed me home and pestered me and pestered me and pestered me. And finally, I um, I, I, I pitched it and the, the university went for it. And I worked on it for an entire year, syllabus, curriculum, guest lecturers, textbooks, field trips, you name it, gave the first lecture. The students absolutely loved it. And that's the thing about ideas and dreams. They matter to us, but I think they matter more to others. Um, yeah. Walt yeah. built Disneyland because it was the toy he never had as a child. Mm. But look how much it matters to all of us all of these many decades later. So I'm I'm up there teaching my dream class, but the students are absolutely loving it. And then the next day, I faced the greatest conflict in my life story when I was diagnosed with that life-threatening brain tumor. And uh, the neurosurgeon at Cedar sinai in downtown Los Angeles um, said to me, it's life-threatening. Um, it's got to come out. Today's Friday. You have the weekend to get your affairs in order. I need you back here on Tuesday for surgery. And because of the invasiveness of the surgery, the recovery was two months which meant I would be out of work that entire time and the class would be immediately canceled. And I thought about Walt. I thought about the bankruptcy, Kansas City, boarding the train, $40 single suitcase, one-way ticket. I was all in. And I looked the neurosurgeon in the eye and I said, sorry, but Tuesday's not going to happen. He thought I was nuts and wanted to know, well, what are you doing that's so important and so significant that you're willing to put off brain surgery and risk your life. Now, when I told him I was a doctor too, teaching a class and teaching a class on the history of Disneyland, <laughs> I thought he was going to kill me long before this tumor <laughs> ever had a chance. But, you know, um, I, I think we all reach a moment in life where um, we come to recognize our ideas, our crazy thoughts, even our dreams convert over to passion. Mm -hmm. And this has become my life's passion. I have this God-given ability um, to see the parks, not just as an escape, but as an example, mm -hmm. not just as the place where dreams come true, but as the place that can show you how to make your own dreams come true. And so that first semester, I wasn't just going to teach this class. I was going to get to live the class. Mm -hmm. And so I went all in. Um, spoiler alert, I lived, um, <laughs> we taught the class, had the surgery, it was successful. And that led to the first of two best selling books. And now I'm not even in academics anymore. I write and speak full time sharing the story with audiences around the country and around the world. My goodness. Thank you for sharing that with us. My goodness. What a powerful story about the power of passion. You know, I've, I've read that the opening day at Disneyland was uh, not exactly according to plan. That's an understatement. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Probably one of the worst days of Walt Disney's <laughs> life. So, so um, how did he handle that? Like what happened and how did he deal with it? So um, the park was built in exactly one year. They broke ground in July of 1954. Uh, opened uh, one year later, July 17th of 1955. And the reason why they opened so quickly was the deal that Walt had to make with ABC Television to get funding for the park. Mm. Um, television was the new emerging technology, and it was Walt's way of getting into um, the living room of every American family and speaking directly to the American consumer, so much so that when the live broadcast premiered on that Sunday afternoon, 90 million Americans tuned in. It was the largest live broadcast to date. Wow. 
Wow. Um, and if you're watching on television, you have no clue that there's anything wrong in Anaheim, California. Um, now, granted, you're watching with 29 cameras and miles and miles and miles of cable. Um, and yeah, you go back and watch it on YouTube and there are miscues all over the place. But in terms of what's actually happening in the park itself, you, you have no idea that it's 105 degrees in the shade. Um, there's no water fountains because there had been a plumber strike. And at the last minute, they went back to work, but they said to Walt, we can either finish the restrooms or finish the water fountains. And Walt picked the you know, restrooms figuring that, you know, people can buy Coke and Pepsi, but he didn't want them peeing in the streets. Um, <laughs> you know, a there's plan. a gas leak in Fantasyland. Uh, the cast member forgets how many guests are boarding the Mark Twain. And so it doubles the allowed capacity and nearly capsizes on the maiden voyage. Um, it was only supposed to be press, media, celebrities, and VIPs. Uh, so uh, they had planned for about 9,000 people that day. And the gates get crashed somewhere between 28 and 33,000 show up. Um, every single attraction except for the world famous Jungle Cruise broke down, broke down multiple times that day. Uh, the pavement on Main Street had been poured that morning. And because of the lack of time and the intense heat, uh, the pavement did not have time to dry. So the women uh, show up and they're showing up right after church because it's 1955. They're in their Sunday best and they step onto Main Street USA and right out of their high heel shoes. And the only store in the park that sh that sells adult shoes is an Indian store in Frontierland, i.e. moccasins. I, I mean, it was just a mess. And the people who said the park would be bankrupt, shuttered, and forgotten in six months or less had a field day with what came to be known as, quote-unquote, Black Sunday. Um, the press skewered Walt the next day. The reviews uh, were absolutely horrific. But here's where Walt shows incredible leadership. Um the parts that he could not fix, i.e. the weather, he just ignored. He had zero control over it. So he spent zero attention, zero energy on it. Um, the areas that he could fix, that he could change, that he could control, that got his focus, that got his attention, that got his energy. Um, you know, responsibility is the ability to respond well. And Walt mm -hmm. responds really, really well to Black Sunday. Um, a lot of us are familiar with the expression, um, as long as there's imagination left in the world, Disneyland will never be finished. Well, that's a response to the press complaining that the park is only half finished on July 17th, 1955. Um, he and his team get to work. Um, they get to work on fixing everything that was wrong they invite the press back. Um, the reviews get better and better and better. By Labor Day, the park is welcoming its one millionth guest. Wow. Wow. That's the resilience of a great leader. That's it is. Astounding. Yeah. And they really did learn their lesson because 11 years later, when they opened Walt Disney World, um, the, uh, uh, the, the park opens on October 1st to only 10,000 guests. And then the grand opening isn't until October 25th. So they basically have three weeks of soft openings because they didn't mm. ever want to repeat the disaster that was Black Sunday. So if you ever hear Disney doing soft openings, it's just a repeat of never wanting to have Black Sunday happen again. I love that because leaders are always evaluating and always learning. Correct. Jeff, if you could share one piece of advice with leaders who are listening today, from your perspective, what would that be? It's not as hard as we want to think that it is. Um, it's it's really quite simple. It doesn't mean that it's easy, but it is quite simple. So, for example, um, when Walt was building Disneyland, um, he hired a fellow out of the aeronautical industry, uh, a gentleman by the name of Van Arsdell France, to create what came to be known as Disney University, which set the standard um, for training in the hospitality industry. And Walt didn't micromanage. And he said to Van Arsdale France, I, I want you to empower the cast members to create happiness. 
And, you know, today we think of Disneyland as what? The happiest place on earth. So it's not that far-fetched that if you're going to be building the happiest place on earth, you want to have happy cast members who are empowered to what? Create happiness. I, I can't tell you how many professors I've come across in academics who don't like students. How many um, Yikes. ministers I've come across who don't like people? How many doctors and nurses I've come across who don't like pay? So again, you know, you, you have to have that cultural fit in terms of not just who you hire, but why you're hiring them. And, and, and it comes down to not just what you do and how you do it, but why you're doing it. Walt was creating the happiest place on earth. And he wanted to hire people who understood not just what they were doing and how they were doing it, but why. Mm. Jeff, I know people are going to want to stay in touch with you and continue learning from you. What's the best way for them to do that? Well, they can find me at thewisdomofwalt.com. And every Wednesday, I have a 100% free uh, Wednesdays with Walt email that goes out. And I tell stories that at the end have a little bit of motivation and inspiration. So I'd love for your your listeners to sign up for that again, uh, thewisdomofwalt.com. And there's a place there uh, for them to sign up for the email slash blog. Um, they can find my books, The Wisdom of Walt, Leadership Lessons from the Happiest Place on Earth, or Beyond the Wisdom of Walt, Life Lessons from the Most Magical Place on Earth. Those books are available on Amazon. Um, they can find me on Facebook, Jeff Barnes, or uh, Instagram at Dr. Disneyland. Uh, but again, I think the easiest place to find me is the wisdom of Walt.com, And then uh, everything just goes from there. We will have all those links in the show notes so people can stay in touch and continue to learn. Thank you so much for the generosity you've shown today, Jeff, in sharing with our listeners from what you've learned from the power well, of the leadership of Walt. Well, thank you for having me. And by the way, anybody who signs up for the uh, Wednesdays with Walt email, um, there's a free download um, leadership lessons from uh, the happiest place on earth. It's seven immediate takeaways uh, that you can apply today to what you're doing as a leader. So let me invite you and encourage you uh, to get that and put that into place right away. I love that. Let's do that right now. (laughs) Jeff, thank you so much again. Thank you. Thanks for joining me for this episode today. As we wrap up, I have a couple of requests for you. I'd love for you to do two things. First, subscribe to this podcast so you don't miss an episode. And if you find value here, I'd love it if you would rate it and review it. That really does make a difference in helping other people to find this podcast. Second, if you don't have a copy of my newest book, Catalytic Leadership, I'd love to put a copy in your hands. If you go to catalyticleadershipbook.com, you can get a copy for free. Just pay the shipping so I can get it to you, and we'll get one right out. My goal is to put this into the hands of as many leaders as possible. This book captures principles that I've learned in 20 plus years of coaching leaders in the entrepreneurial space, in business, government, nonprofits, education, and the local church. You can always connect with me on LinkedIn to keep up with what I'm learning and thinking about. And if you're ready to take a next step with a coach who can help you to intentionally grow and thrive as a leader, I'd be honored to help you. Just go to catalyticleadership.net to book a call with me. And stay tuned for our next episode next week. Until then, as always, leaders, choose to be catalytic. Thanks for listening to Catalytic Leadership with Dr. William Attaway. Be sure to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss the next episode. Want more? Go to catalyticleadership.net.